where would you like to start? Well, I think it, uh, in light of just uh, current history within the church and the world, uh, so many prophecies that seemingly missed it concerning our last year's presidential election that had, prophecies had a lot of coverage and a friend of mine tracked them and there were uh, at least 30 prophetic ministries ministries recognized to some degree as prophetic ministries or prophets that uh, missed it. Um, uh, and there's a lot of confusion that uh, not just the age-old question, does God still give revelation today and still speak to us? But uh, if he does, uh, why is there so much confusion about what he's saying and what he isn't saying? And uh, that might be a good jumping off point. Yeah. Yeah, I think that'd be good. I mean, it, I've heard John Paul in, um, it was an interview, I think it was like 2003, late 2003, uh, Mark Sharona was interviewing him, and I think might have been Paul Keith Davis on TBN uh, at that time, and they were talking about the prophetic, and John Paul was just sharing his heart for, for purity, and he was asking, like, how many of you can remember what happened on March 3rd, 2003? And, you know, neither one of the other guys could remember anything, because nothing happened. But how many prophetic words were there that 3303, it was the, the sign of the Trinity, it was going to be this astounding day, it was going to mark the beginning of the great revival we've been waiting for, it was going right. to be a shift in the Christian church, and absolutely nothing happened, and nobody ever got back up and, and apologized for it. And he's like, where are the prophetic people that will actually take responsibility for the words that they share and bring that accountability? Right. Uh, the beautiful thing is when, when I learned, I learned about prophetic ministry really from John Paul. And that's one of his, one of his high values that, that he spoke into us and sowed into us in, in a lot of different ways, re required that accountability uh, of us as well. And it seems like that, just even the idea of being accountable is not okay with some people. Right. I mean, I... I heard someone that, you know, internationally known teacher on the prophetic in an interview about everything that just happened with the election. And, and they were saying, you know, if you're a prophet and you, and you prayed and you believe that you heard from God and what you said was going to happen didn't come to pass, you shouldn't apologize because you had the word of the Lord, even if it didn't come to pass. I'm like, What? Like, how, how did we even get to that place right. that we could think that and suggest that and authoritatively suggest that that's how it should be? Right. right. Well, I think um, a couple of responses come to that, to my mind. Um, one, uh, it, it's, it's like a lot of things in life that they're taken overly seriously in one sense, but not seriously enough in another sense. And there's a segment of the uh, body of Christ, particularly in Pentecostal and charismatic circles that are continuing clamoring for prophetic words uh, that in on one sense, I think, um, and I'm, I'm, I wanna qualify what I'm saying here, they take prophecy overly seriously to the point of neglecting the word of God with all the promises and all the values of God that teach us his ways that we might know him. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, they don't take it seriously enough. Uh, you know, if, um, I don't know, if I'm sitting at a convenience store with uh, three or four friends and you pull in and say, hey, I'm a stranger around here and there's this intersection, I'm trying to get in so-and-so, and I stand up and say, oh, I absolutely know what you should do. Uh, Go straight for a half mile, turn left, quarter mile, then turn right, and you'll be. And uh, you do that, and you find out it's just been the opposite way in which you should have gone. I think you have a right to come back to me and say, <laughs> Gosh, I appreciate, you know, I want to give you an E for effort for trying to help me, but you were wrong. And at that point, just human decency and kindness says, I'm sorry. You know, right. I'm sorry I misdirected you. And so my initial response to, um, that argument or viewpoint about not needing to apologize if we're honestly trying to serve God, if we make a mistake, is uh, 
uh, we're not taking seriously that we're speaking to people's lives and people's lives matter. They certainly matter to God. Yeah. They're especially within the body of Christ. As David said, these are the majestic ones in whom God delights. So we need to take seriously um, the gift of prophecy. But on a, on a bigger note, I think what's more concerning for me, John, is uh, I think, and again, I'm, I'm painting with a broad brush stroke here, I think we are in the contemporary church uh, operating with a low uh, understanding, a low heart revelation of the awesomeness of God, the holiness of God, the majesty of God. And so when I say this, I'm not talking about someone that maybe once every three years will be in a church meeting or a home group and all of a sudden they, they feel like God giving them something to say to encourage people or or gosh, God is burning this verse into me. And I, I think, can I share this with you? I'm not talking about that, but when we talk about people that feel called to uh, ongoing uh, ministry of the charisma gift prophesying or prophetic ministry or the ministry of the prophet, that if we claim to be representing God Almighty in all of his holiness, glory, and authority, there has to be, within the context that God is love, there has to be some accountability. Yeah. Otherwise, I think we're at grave risk of marginalizing uh, the great I am-ness, if I can yeah. say that, the great I am-ness of God Almighty. Um, you know, Paul said, uh, in just basic Christian living, work out your salvation with fear and trembling because it's the Spirit of God, the presence of God within you wants to work out His will and His good pleasure. So if working our salvation with fear and trembling on just the basics of uh, this is healthy, this is unhealthy, and, and so on, how much more if we're claiming to be a mouthpiece yeah. for God Almighty? So, uh, and I, I, I am familiar with some very well-known ministries uh, that you're alluding to, and not to take anything away from the impact and the fruitfulness right. what they've carried, but... Um, I, I think, biblically speaking, I, I would have uh, some major uh, issues yeah. <laughs> with that uh, yeah. position. Yeah, there's um, one, of, one of the things that I've seen in myself and, and others, just in being around the prophetic for, for a little while now, um, often when God speaks, there is metaphor there. Yeah. And it, it's, it's often easier to get the revelation than it is to understand it. Right. <laughs> and know what to do right. with it. Right. And, you know, one of the one of the comments that comes with, well, you can't say that you missed it because maybe you just misunderstood it. Yeah. What would you say to somebody that, that said that, hey, um, you said this was going to happen. It didn't happen. Well, but this is what I was I was seeing. I just misunderstood what I what I said. How, how would you respond to that? I would say there's um, there's a, a, a fair degree of truth in that. But I would also say to whom much is given, and again, we're not talking about someone who occasionally the Holy Spirit speaks right. a prophetic word of encouragement through once in a blue moon, but someone who really feels called to develop the charisma gift or a prophetic calling. To whom much is given, much is required. And so I would be the first to say there's a lot of truth in that. And, you know, we know in part, we prophesy in part. And I know that sometimes um, when I'm prophesying over individuals, for example, I will say something like, uh, um, you know, I'm seeing this, uh, is this relevant to you? Uh, like I remember uh, years ago in a meeting, I was prophesying over a lady going through a particularly difficult time in life. And she, um, uh, something like her father had died a while back. and going through some marriage tensions and things like that. And as I was praying for her, uh, the Lord gave me a picture of her as a young girl uh, in a, a backyard with a white picket fence and like an apple tree and a swing set, and her father pushing her this. Now, that could have meant two things that it could have meant, well, you know, this is just an illustration you want uh, to understand that God, this is how God is. He's a father that loves to take care of you and bless you in many different areas. Or it could have been God showing me something that actually took place in her life, an actual situation. And so I said, I'm not, I'm not sure about this. Uh, does this mean anything to you? And she started weeping and she said, that's the house I grew up in as a child. We had a white picket fence in the backyard, apple trees and a swing set. 
and my dad used to come out and and uh, play with me, swing me, uh, swing me on the swing set. And she wow. said, I just have great memories yeah. of that with my dad. And uh, so it led into a whole you know avenue of ministry, as it were. But and I think there's there's room for that. But I think. Um, you know, as the old saying is, there's three parts of revelation. There's the revelation itself, there's the interpretation, and then there's the application. And when I teach on sorting through those three uh, facets and ministering a prophetic word to somebody, I, you know, I, I, I say sometimes as we seek the Lord, we don't always get the interpretation. But then I think we have to be open-handed, uh, right. as we say, I'm not sure, but it could mean this, but you really need to pray about it. I, I, I think particularly as we think about um, the recent presidential election, and um, one thing we don't want to do, or at least I don't want to do on these videos, is <laughs> delve into politics. Right. So that's not my intent when I say this, but a lot of us um, really uh, uh, agreed with uh, uh, one, at least one facet of former President Trump, his desire to not use federal tax dollars to support abortion with Planned Parenthood and to really combat uh, abortion. Um, so a lot of us said, well, this is a godly value. You know, babies are in God's image. We need to protect them. Yeah. And so there began to be a thing where um, President Trump had to be God's man. And, uh, you know, all of this. And I appreciate the Cyrus, you know, comparison. But I, I think it was, that's what it was at best. It was a comparison. I don't, I don't really believe he was Cyrus for this day and age, although uh, there's uh, application there. But um, as, we, as I was sharing the other day and uh, here at Streams, when we were doing some teaching, that um, um, I've been an avid motorcyclist for most of my life, really, but especially the last 30 years. And um, I need to be careful I say this, I like going really fast in the mountain curves, but, <laughs> but I also pressure, uh, put a value on my skin being healthy. Yeah. <laughs> so I do a lot of reading and studying about uh, safe motorcycling. And I read a number of years ago about, um, I think it was in London, England, or maybe throughout the UK, that when they train motorcycle policemen to be good motorcycle riders on duty, one of the things they teach them is when they're about to shift lanes to take a second look. And meaning you not look in your mirror if you're going to shift in the right hand lane, but you look over your shoulder. But they teach them to look back quickly and then look again. And they recognize that over the years there were many motorcycle accidents from people looking once when they want to shift lanes. But the problem is they were seeing what they want to see. That everything was happening so quickly that, you know, they were just not seeing an oncoming car because they wanted to shift. And I, I think. That's a, to me, it's a powerful illustration, including in the prophetic, uh, when it comes to that area. Sometimes we think we're hearing God say something or we think God is showing something because that's what we want to see. Yeah. And we need to learn to take a second look, saying, Lord, am I really hearing you? Am I really seeing this? Because our, our human imagination, especially if we've been, for example, in a mode of worship, like in a really good worship setting, or, you know, uh, or we have been in a, uh, by ourselves praying for half an hour, 45 minutes, and, you know, we're really sensing a bit of the manifest presence of the Lord, and, you know, there's maybe conviction and things happening, and then we begin to pray into something like the upcoming election or this or that. Um, there, is, there is very much a legitimate sense of God being there, but then there can be an unhealthy intertwining be, uh, between the presence of God and what he's communicating and what we yeah. want God to say. Yeah. And I think, uh, again, it gets back to what we were speaking about a few moments ago. The, I think the, the radical seriousness of a prophetic ministry or a prophet claiming to represent the throne of God. Um, you know, and we think about Jesus in the garden, praying about the upcoming, you know, everything he was going to go through and the crucifixion, the beating, the whipping, uh, the torture, all of that. Three times he prayed that prayer, Father, let this cup pass. If it's possible, not my will, but your will be done. And I think uh, in many areas of life, obviously, but including the prophetic ministry, 
when it comes to seeking God over an issue that's important to our heart, we need to realize it's not necessarily what we want, but we're merely servants. We're merely messengers. What does the Father desire to say? Yeah. What's coming from the throne of God, not what I desire? And um, there is a need to almost step beside oneself and say, this isn't about me. It's not about what I want. And, you know, it's wonderful when we hear God say something we really want him to say. Yeah. But I think there's uh, an unhealthy uh, going beyond that at times. Yeah. yeah. One of the things is in, in how you're sharing that is this application of humility to the prophetic. Yeah. And sometimes there's a, there's a temptation, especially when we become known for being prophetic. Maybe we've gotten a couple words right and people are looking to us for, for revelation, for uh, understanding of what's going to come. There's a temptation to believe other people's thoughts about us. Yeah. And they, it, it can be very easy to put somebody with a big prophetic gift on a pedestal. Right. Because it's astounding. I mean, when God speaks something about the future, when he speaks something that couldn't be known, and it comes through an individual, I mean, it, that's astounding. Right. And it can be very easy to start to think, wow, look at them instead of, wow, look at him. Right. right. And when people do that to us, if we're, if we're not maintaining that place of humility, then it becomes very easy to have a little bit and assume that our understanding of the revelation is actually God's understanding of the revelation. Right. Right. And maintaining that humility, while I heard this, I'm not 100% sure what it means. Right. But that, that's actually okay to say, and it's right. not a bad thing. Sometimes we're afraid of that, because, you know, I mean, if we don't completely understand every bit of revelation that we get, then we may not be quite as anointed, and people may not listen to us as much. Which is actually, it's untrue. Right. It's untrue, but that's pride that sneaks in there. And, and being able to have that humility, and that humility allows us to be able to, to be gentler with how we say things. Yeah. Instead of, you know, hey, God told me this was going to happen. Now, I mean, if I hear the audible voice of God, I'm going to say, hey, I just heard the audible voice right. of God say right. this. Right. But most of the time, it's dreams, it's visions, it's thoughts, it's understandings, it's scripture, it's conversations, yeah. and they all come together right. to give a sense of what right. God is saying. Right. And like, I can recognize God is speaking, and this is what I believe right. Right. is being said. And just that humility alone, I think, will really help the the situations like what happened recently with the elections. Right. If there would have been more humility in how those things were shared. Right. If, or, and some people did share it with a lot of humility. So I'm not saying everybody that shared something. Right. Like, uh, not at all. But with some of them, then it would have been easier to be able to come back and say, hey, you know, I, right. I misunderstood. Right. Instead of having to say, no, I, I heard right. It's just circumstances that are misunderstood. Right. Right. Um that that is is really key yeah and i think uh very much in line uh part and parcel with what you're talking about humility is also um you know one of the things we talked about this weekend is uh i i make clear distinctions when i'm teaching about prophetic callings uh, differences between prophetic ministries those called to prophesy over a lot of individuals and maybe do it in numerous settings numerous churches numerous conferences and as well, quite often they're adept at training and equipping, which is a great value. I make a distinction between that and someone who's called to the ministry of the prophet, which is, uh, uh, I think that one of the differences is someone called the ministry of the prophet is primarily more concerned about the word of the Lord to the church or churches as opposed to words over individuals. But as well, I think there's a, uh, those called to the ministry of the prophet are, you know, what, Others before me, including John Sanford, have called burden bearers. And we look at the seven messages Jesus had to the seven churches. There were certain burdens that John the Revelator was relaying, you know. And these are certain problems that exist right now in this particular season of church life in the United States or Western yeah. world, whatever. Uh, but um, 
But the third area is, is as we talked about, is uh, really um, being more um, motivated by the glory of Christ rather than the events that God's going to do, rather than the gifts God's give us, being more excited about the gift giver himself. And Revelation 19.10, the, the spirit of prophecy is uh, the testimony of Jesus. And the, the deeper someone goes into a prophetic calling, the more they should be motivated, not just by blessing people, get ready for this. I mean, that's part of it. But uh, I like to say that what an evangelist is to those that don't know Christ, someone who can help them see Jesus more clearly, that's what a prophet is to the church, enabling the church to see Jesus more clearly. But having said all of that, um, uh, taking the, whether it's a prophetic ministry or a ministry of the prophet seriously, um, when we talk about the humility, it, it works two ways. Not only humility before God and the church as we speak, but also, um, when we look at each believer, having a high regard for their priesthood. Yeah. You know, both what Moses said, uh, God told Moses say to the people, but also what uh, Peter picked up on, we are a nation of priests. And that word priest in the Hebrew, anyway, it means Kohen, Kohen, one who draws near to God. And so even though not all people in the body of Christ have the gift of prophecy, and even they do, there's varying levels of revelation and clarity which they see things and understand things that um as you talked about you know entering into a false sort of pride i'm i'm the prophet i'm the man of god you know that sort of thing that we're recognizing that as we whatever venue whether we're speaking on a, a zoom meeting to people or in a live conference or you know speaking to an individual that they too, if they're a Christian, have the Spirit of God within them. So it's not never a matter of telling someone what to do, yeah. or but it's a matter of encouraging them to respond to the Spirit of God within them. Yes. Um, the first book I wrote many years ago was called Walking Out of Spiritual Abuse. And um, one of the things we focused on um, was, uh, in fact, it kind of became the, the ethos of the book was towards the end of Proverbs, um, Solomon said, one of the things the earth cannot stand is when a slave becomes king. Mm -hmm. And when someone has a bondage in their life, uh, like uh, fear of man, uh, deep insecurities, fear of rejection, when they're a slave to that to a degree, and all of a sudden they come into a position of power, uh, abuse is gonna happen, you know? That's why, one of the reasons why when John Paul and I originally began to talk, dialogue about doing this, uh, we recognized it's not just a matter of drawing out from the scriptures what's healthy protocol, but representing the Father heart of God, yeah. uh, you know, out of a position of wholeness. Uh, I like to say the messenger is the message, the teacher is the teaching, the prophet is the prophecy. It's not so much what we say that impacts people, but it, it's who we are. Uh, it's it's what we're carrying more than the actual words although obviously the words are vitally important and uh, the more since the 60s uh the so-called sexual revolution um marriage uh, healthy marriages have become more and more devalued and marginalized so many children they grow up with broken families and by the time you get to your third or fourth stepfather whatever you know there's there's no real sense of, uh, for the most part, of significance and value in who you are, you know, growing up. And I'd, I'd like to suggest, I don't, again, I don't want to make this the in all and end all catch all thing here, but uh, whether someone ends up as a, a senior leader of a church or a prophetic ministry uh, or someone who has a lot of high visibility, if they're in bondage to insecurity, fear of man, fear of rejection, uh, fear of failure, they're going to overcompensate. And I, this is something I personally have had to deal with in my life. You know, I grew up, um, my father was in the Air Force. We moved nine times during my school years. And I can remember a number of schools and the uh, moves in the middle of the school year, you know, getting in fist fights the first day because, you know, the new kid on the block and, you know, it's, it's just a mess. And I'm an introvert to begin with, as many prophetic people are, but that just, you know, just 
And so I grew up with a real uh, fear of my peers and fear of speaking in front of people. And so it didn't happen overnight, but it's been a long period of time uh, intertwined with the prophetic ministry where um, uh, not getting, learning to not get my sense of value, my not sense of significance of being in front of the crowd, but not just that, but the man of God has the word of God. Don't even question it, that sort of thing, you know? And uh, being able to say, you know, I'm just throwing this out there for you to pray about me, right. as Paul said, uh, weigh the word. And well, anyway, I'm going on quite a bit here, but I, I think um, when we talk about pride, um, yeah, pride's a problem, but what is the avenue by which pride is coming in? What is it yes. compensating for? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because if we don't find that root, then we're, I mean, you can pull off pride, pull off pride, but it's like pulling off an apple off of an apple tree. Another one's going to grow. It may take a season, but another one's going to just gonna grow. What are you going to replace there. it with? Yeah, yeah you, you've got you've to go to the root of those issues. And